So we're going to hear today about Bobos, a multimedia project dedicated to collecting the narrator, the narratives of farm workers in California, and specifically agricultural migrants from rural Mexico. Uh, and the goal is to archive the collection in the Library of Congress. And um, our speaker is Maria Opet, a self-described queer, vegan, motorcycle riding, California-based <laughs> artist from Sinaloa. She's the daughter of Mexican farm workers, the oldest of eight. As a child, she worked in the fields herself alongside her grandfather. She's produced uh, programs for Radio Bilingue and also for KPFK, our Pacifica sister station to KPFK in, um, in the Bay Area and Berkeley. And uh, we're gonna hear about migrant farmers from the California Central Valley. And uh, these are stories that she collects with her team of eco-feminist radio producers and broadcasters. And this is an effort to make part of California's invisible history visible. Buenas tardes, uh, bienvenidos a todos. Welcome to everyone for being here. But most importantly, thank you to UCLA, the Chicano Studies, the History Department, the Oral History Department, for giving us this opportunity to present this project to you. I will start with uh, a story of my names, because when I was working with Susan via email, and one email said, uh, by what name she goes? Has so many names here around. <laughs> so um, my name of family is Maria Esther Morales Castro, uh, typical for Latin families to give their child a long name. So I start and shorten the name very con for very concise, and I choose for Maria Morales. Why Maria Morales? Because I grew up with the uh, classical films in Mexico from Sara Garcia, Jorge Negrete, Pedro Infante, Javier Solis. It was a film that calls Hijos de Maria Morales. <laughs> so when I introduced myself to someone, I said, Maria Morales, pero sin hijos. So <laughs> the, 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 the people laugh because uh, they know the relationship between the names. So as Susan said already, I grew up in a small farm town in the Northwest Coast in the Pacific Ocean in the state of Sinaloa and Mexico. I spent a lot of time with my grandfather gathering maize, cotton, garbanzo in his fields. So one of my biggest passions is to travel, to live within the communities, to live with the people, with the people of the land. So in 1999, I moved to San Francisco from Chicago and missing the agricultural area that I was coming from and the landscape that I was coming from, Sinaloa. I decided to move to Salinas. And at the time, I was working for Radio Bilingue as a radio producer. I was doing a uh, script for farm workers in issues of health with the support of California Endowment. At that moment, I saw the beauty of those voices, the necessity to express themselves. And it was right then, 13 years ago, that Mobos was born within me. Let's see the clip what I'm doing at the present moment. Mi nombre es Maruca Morales Opet. Soy originaria de México. with my grandfather all their work, hand work. And I learned the importance of respect the land and the beauty of appreciating the land. 
My bent it will be to document this beauty of these farm workers. I would like to make them feel human. Living in San Francisco and missing the agriculture area that I'm from, I decided to move to Salinas, California. I create this project that called Mobos. Our goal is to give them voice by archiving them in the Library of Congress. ¿Le da melancolía de vez en cuando a usted? ¿Cómo no? Desde México para trabajar. Ya teníamos un ranchito allá. ¿Y aquí tiene todo su ah, Aquí tengo todos mis hijos. Dos marines. ¿Ninguno mecánico? Sí, el mecánico. Incluso va a venir la semana que entra a ayudarme aquí porque está estudiando y, y a la vez ya es veterano. The these farm workers came here and they work in the land for all these years and they give very good education to their family. And we don't know those things. We just think that farm workers are illegal in this country or they came here to take advantage of this country, which is a misunderstanding. Has trabajado tú en el campo? Uh, en el campo, sí. Ah, pues he trabajado en mucho, lo que es en el melón, en cereza, tomate, en todo, en muchas cosas he trabajado. ¿Y te gusta? Ah, sí, sí, sí me gusta. Tengo que trabajar. Para sacar adelante a la familia. Sí. Entonces, ¿tú crees que aquí vas a formar tu sueño americano, el que dicen, no? ¿Eso estás formando tú? Ah, pues estoy ah, tratando de hacerlo. Sí. When I was working with Radio Bilingüe, I saw the necessity to record these voices, but in a level of oral history. We don't know all these struggles, and we don't know their successes as well. For me, being in a motorcycle is in a state of meditation, almost. Yes, with me, in this machine, in the air, this is a beautiful sensation. is a composed word. It means more for more and voice for voices, equal more voices. That is dedicated to collect the narratives of farm workers in California. And uh, we're going to be focusing in different regions in the Central Valley, in, the, in Salinas Valley, in Coachella Valley, in Tulare, in County. So let me let me tell you a little bit how and how this project identified to me. My grandfather taught me, and he has strong values about the importance of the land, about the need for us to respect the land and the beauty to appreciate the land. People from all over come to him to seek for advice in his wisdom of the rains, in his wisdom of how to cultivate the land. My father knew intuitively about permaculture, and this is a long time ago. So two years ago, two months before he died, I had a conversation with my grandfather and here is my conversation with him. A ver, cuéntenos la historia. ¿Cómo usted empezó a hacer todo esto de la agricultura? Yo la historia que empecé a hacer, cuando entró Cárdenas, lo pidió ayuda. Yo estaba plebontito, que, que, que quería ser presidente de la República y que lo ayudáramos y que lo iba a dar tierra más recibida. Y le queríamos. Y, y los, y los y cumplió todo, porque lo dio parcela, decomisó el petróleo, decomisó el tamizal a los ringos, a los quitó, y, y lo dio a la tierra y a la chingada, a la ruina. Ya no hubo ruina porque ya 
Y usted está hablando de Lázaro Cárdenas, ¿verdad? De Lázaro Cárdenas, sí. Sí, el, el presidente de México. ¿Y en qué, en qué fecha fue esto, abuelo? Pues fue antes de 1912. Oiga, abuelo, ¿y, ¿y cuando empezaron a hacer agricultura, cómo estructuraron el sistema de riego, la semilla, eh, todo eso? ¿Cómo se mantenían con todo eso? Nosotros había un canal ya de este que estaba para que tu abuelo, ¿te acuerdas? El canal este que está de que la niña. Sí, ajá. Ahora en eso con pala, pura palo, le hicimos ganando a dos pesos la tarea y trabajando por dos pesos uno todo el día con la... So, that is the translation. I forgot to click and go back there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. But um, I didn't end this in purpose, so... <laughs> um, so, speaking with my grandfather since I was a child, he taught me so many aspects of life. And thanks to him, I explore around the world in Payson communities, in France, in the Netherlands, in Spain, in Portugal, all those spaces in the world. So I was going and exploring in the countryside with my son, with patients, and talk to them. But it's thanks to him that he cultivated this in me as a young child. So agricultural workers, we know they are all over the world. They are storytellers by nature. They talk about agriculture, they talk about fertilizers, they talk about pesticides, they talk about new technologies. So these farm workers, they can give us the stories very naturally and very simply. It's what we want to gather as a storytelling and oral history from these farm workers in the rural California. Let's see a little bit of history and historia of of agriculture in the, in the United States. In 1848 to 1846 uh, to 48 uh, was the Mexican-American War. And here we sign the Treaty of Guadalupe. I know you are historians here. If I'm wrong, correct me, okay? okay. I, will I would love to, to, for you to support this and, and help me. So in 1850 to 1880, 50,000 Mexicans workers came to the United States. In 1910 to 20, the Mexican Revolution appears in Mexico. 1911 to 1970, the immigration, immigration of agricultural workers came from Mexico. In 1914, World War I is here. This is very interesting to me. In 1920, 31,000 students enrolled in agricultural courses. In 1921, radio broadcast began. In 29 to 39, the Great, Great Depression. From the 32 to 36, the Dust Bowl conditions developed. 1939 to 1945, World War War appeared. 20 years later, 1920 to 1940, 584,000 students enrolled in agricultural courses in the United States. Why is that? I'm curious. So we're going to explore that later. In 1942 to 1964, the Bracero program. Are you related to the Bracero programs? And you know what is the Bracero program? You know. 1947, the National Union appears. In 1962, this wonderful movement appeared of Cesar Chavez with Dolores Huerta, the United Farm Workers that we call today. In the present, where we are approximately 12 million undocumented farm workers in the United States. 
as we speak, probably more. So California is the home for the largest agricultural economy, 37.0 billion in in annual crops sales. So the double double of any state in the United States. So what we do over more than a hundred years this work has been done by farm workers. We need, I think, to respect these farm workers on some level. We need to acknowledge them. All of those years of history and knowledge and experience. So what we do, what would we do, Mohos? What we would try to do is to go from community to community to gather the voices of these farm workers in their lands, in their fields, in their communities. How we will do this? So we will retrofitting, as we speak, an Airstream trailer that we will be designing a recording studio where we can take this recording studio to their fields and gather their the stories. Because they, don't, they cannot go nowhere. They will be shy to go to any museum and speak about themselves. So we need to bring these recording studios to them. So this is going to be the design. I'm working at the present with some architects and how we're going to design the Airstream. In the front is going to be the, uh, a table with, with two benches for them to, to sit down and and start recording in one of the sites. It's going to be a monitor with one of the producers controlling all the equipment. Two monk bed, a little kitchen for us to be able to cook a little bit, and two beds, and then the bath, the bathrooms, and, and, and the toilet. This is what we're aiming to do. This is just um, drawings. So, what regions would we go? As I told you, we will be going to the Central Valley first, then Madera, Fireball, Fresno, Kerman, Mendota, and all these cities. The Salinas Valley, Chular, Salinas, Greenfield, King City, Soledad, and Gonzales. The Tulare County. This will be the first cities will be approached. Why? Because the, in these cities are a concentration of indigenous communities. They are very, very valuable for us to gather first these stories. Why? Because when I called the Library of Congress and asking for, risk, and asking for statistics about if they have archived those stories somewhere, uh, the director of acquisition, acquisitions has told me that they have very little material about them. So that at that moment I thought, oh my God, this is this is great that they don't have material. So it's time for us to do really something right now. So I'm working with the director, and we will see in the future how we're going to structure these interviews and these archives for the Library of Congress. Of course, we need to have trainings and all of that for them to archive these stories. So this is one of the voices that I interviewed uh, not long ago. This one doesn't have translation. So I apologize for the persons who don't speak Spanish, but we're working in the translation um, for the next presentation, okay? ¿Cuántos años tiene usted haciendo agricultura? Pues ya hasta la cuenta perdí, pero un promedio de unos 22, 24 años. ¿Y cómo fue que empezó? Okay. Con, yeah. este, con este oficio. Okay. Um, soy mexicana, tercera generación de emigrantes, trabajadores agrícolas. Mi padre y mi abuelo vinieron contratados en los 60s al estado de Texas. Mi madre emigró hace 36 años. Entonces, uh, en consecuencia emigraron mis hermanos y al final emigré eh, como trabajadora de Toda, uh, toda mi familia, al, algunas todavía siguen siendo trabajadores del campo, trabajadores para la compañía. Y por cosas de la 
vida mi madre se lastimó en, en su trabajo y fue deshabilitada de por vida y la invitaron a una charla sobre agricultura orgánica y nos invitó a todos los hijos y sus hijas a participar en esa, en esa charla y ahí fue donde yo escuché por primera vez agricultura orgánica entonces uh, más que que el interés de ser un agricultor orgánico fue la, la curiosidad de saber qué era una agricultura orgánica. Eh, todos mis hermanos y mi, mi hermana entramos a la capacitación de tres años y la única que terminó la capacitación fue yo. Estuve tres años en una escuela que se llamaba antes en Rural Development Center en Salinas, ahora se llama Alba Orgánica. So this is Maria Catalan, is one of the few Mexican farm workers that produce uh, organic products in, in uh, Hollister. And I met her in, uh, in Berkeley because he, she's been doing farmer's market for 20 years. So she knows the trend of farmer, farmer's market in the, in the Bay Area very well. And this is another voice that I have. Uh, this is translated, it has subtitles, okay? <laughs> okay. The way of living is so natural and beautiful that we should learn from them. They are disappearing, little by little. We should preserve them. Buenas tardes, ¿cómo estás? Bien, bien, ustedes. ¿Qué andas haciendo? Aquí andamos combatiendo la plaga que tienen en los parques. Y yo soy del estado de Puebla. ¿Y cuánto tiempo tienes que te viniste aquí a Estados Unidos? Y llevo siete años. Entonces, ¿te gusta lo que andas haciendo ahorita? Sí, porque no es el único trabajo que hago. Yo riego la almendra, el pistacho, el melón, el tomate. Entonces, tú eres una parte fundamental para el país. Pues yo pienso que sí, ya ve que en la agricultura todo se cosecha y sin la agricultura yo pienso que no, no, no hay futuro, tanto para el país como para nosotros. ¿Cuál es tu recuerdo más grande de México? Ay, pues mis padres, que llevo mucho tiempo que no los miro. ¿Piensas que algún día los vas a volver a ver? Primero Dios sí. Dinos tu nombre. Flavio Martínez. ¿Tienes no, hermanos? Y... Sí, tengo hermanos. ¿Y nadie de allá está aquí? No. ¿Tú solo? Sí, yo solo. ¿Los ayudas? Sí. Les ayudo a mis hermanos y a mis papás. So, this is little clips of, of films that we have done. But, um, for me it's incredible, these voices. The people so humble and beautiful. And um, they are really willing to tell us their story in every level. So is that why I want to share with you these, these clips. And also, the project is a multimedia platform. It's video and audio. Both will be um, um, uh, archived somewhere. But that is our purpose. And in the future, we would love to incorporate photography and paintings. So when we go to the fields to have a photographer just doing portraits of farm workers, also a, a painter who can bring all his uh, easels and start painting the landscape that we are going. So that is our purpose in the future. But in the beginning, we will start just with audio and video. So this is the team that we are right now. Um, Nicole. Nicola Blair is an amazing filmmaker. She did the film that I, that I showed you, the first one. Nicole is um, 
what, how I can put Nicole, how I can explain how she is. When I first met Nicole, she, the first thing she asked me, do you speak Spanish? And instead of me asking her if I, <laughs> if I speak Spanish. So that was our first connection. And uh, all this team has been coming to, to me very organically and very natural. natural. So it's how things has been working. So Nicole is, um, uh, is a scholar from the Coin Foundation in, in, San, in San Francisco. So one of the uh, administrators of the Point Foundation um, told me that he really wanted to introduce this, this uh, young lady to me. And she can, he can see how we can work together. So when I met Nicole and explained the project, she said, of course, I would love to contribute to the project. So she's now the, the director of the video component for Mobos. And Angel, Angel is, uh, Angel is a graphic designer, so she helped me to put all this this uh, presentation together. Kristen, when, well, when I met Angel, uh, the first time that I met her, I was doing my business card in a, in a little shop in Berkeley. And uh, I went there and I explained to the owner that I want to do a letterpress business card because it's, it's very old style of doing this business card that I want for my boss. And she said, of course, we can do it. Um, and we start working together. And two weeks or one month later, she called me and said to me, uh, I cannot continue working with you and your business card, but I have a team member that I would like for you to meet. It was Angel. And so when I arrived to the, to the shop to meet Angel, she told me, uh, because I arrived in my motorcycle, she said to me, Oh my God, I rode a motorcycle as well, and I really like that connection. <laughs> so everything happened like that with Mobos. I have a story for every single one. It's not that I'm sitting them with them uh, in front of them and recruiting them. I do the opposite. If the people click for this project and has a passion for this project, is how I'm putting this together. So if they have that, is how I work. I work with more with human relation than anything. So in Kristen, Kristen is the social media for us, all, all the social media she handled it. And she's an apprentice in KPFA in Berkeley. So my background from KPFA, I was an apprentice for two years. So I went through the program and I studied them and I volunteered them and produced a show every week for two years. With the mem with, we were only three, so it was very hard to produce a show every single uh, Friday with three of us. Sometimes I just did that show by myself. I mean, I just called a writer and I said, okay, I want to interview you for my show because uh, uh, I, I need to do this immediately, you know? <laughs> so I know the hard work that it is to be as apprentice and as a student as well, because you need really, when you have hands-on activities as a student, is when you really, really learn. No coming to school and study the books and do your homework. That is, that is part, but the real part is when you really go and work in the fields. For me, that is, that is what it is, this project. That go and be in the fields with these communities. So Kristen, um, I proposed to her if she wanna do something with my boss and she said she would take care of uh, social media. But my goal is to hire the producers that came from this department in the future. Because I know that, it, that that is my background and that is my my Ruth, the apprenticeship program from KPFA. So, and James, James is our audio specialist. He's a student of uh, the Academy of Off Art in San Francisco. And I met him through Nicole because he was syncing all the audio through the, vid, uh, the videos that we, 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 we was doing. And we have worked in different projects together. And Ralph, Ralph uh, I was actually approaching his wife because his wife is a writer. And um, when I asked his wife if uh, she would like to be part of this project, she told me that she doesn't have time, but she has his, her husband that could be interested. <laughs> and I say, okay, let me, let, let me meet your husband. And I went and have tea with him in his home. And um, 
And since then, Ralph has been our right hand in every writing and press releases that we've done. Amazing guy, very gentle. I just have a meeting with him. I go to his house and he, I already find the tea next to me and I start talking, he start writing. So it's how we work. So that is our team. And I, I would love to have more team members. If you are one of them here, just let me know. Okay. So our advisory board uh, is the same way. Right, Kuder, I was working at, uh, at KPFA and the director told me, uh, do you want to go and see this uh, musician is coming to a union hall in San Francisco? He didn't tell me the name until later. Uh, he said, uh, you would love him. I believe you would love him. So when I asked him to tell me who it is, and he said, it's Ray Kutter. I said, oh my God, Ray Kutter, I would love to go and see him. By the way, he told me, print your project proposal and give it to him. I said, no, I cannot do that. <laughs> and then he goes, do it. And I said, why? Just listen to me, he said, that director, and, and give it to him. He will be a great, a great um, uh, advisory board in the project. I said, okay, I will do it. You, you don't want to do it for me? Say no, he said no. So um, when I first walked in the hall, I was very nervous. I said, I've, I've never done this, but I'm going to do it. So when I walked in the hall, I, I went to the table. Somebody was uh, selling CDs and books, I believe. And I went, and it was a lady and a young gentleman. It was his wife and his son. So, and when I explained to him I'm from KPFA, oh, they love it. So we started the conversation very open, and I said to him, to the son uh, and the, the wife, I would like to meet Ray because I have something to give to him. And his son told me, go now, he's tuning the, the guitar. So I went to the corner and tapping his shoulder, and I said, hey, Ray, I want to give to you this, but read it later. Um, you don't have to respond today, and just I would love to, to hear from you. Next day, he called me, and he told me, I'm on your project, and I would love to do the music for any stories that you need. So it's amazing for me to, to, to receive the feedback from him. For those that don't know him, yeah. his background. Well, Ray Kutter is one of the best musicologists in the United States, is what I, how I can put Ray Kutter. So David Bacon, most of you who study here, all your students, right? <laughs> you know who is David Bacon. So uh, David Bacon is one of the best photographers for farm workers in, in the United States and also in Mexico, and very active in labor and union um, setups. So. So Sandra Flores, uh, Sandra Flores is a member of uh, a foundation from Fresno. And when I first met her and, um, and I finished my presentation, she asked me, the first thing she asked me before anything, don't, don't you need more advisory boards in your committee? I said, yes, I do. And she raised the hand and she said, I want to be part of that. So it's how we we gather people in this project <laughs> when they really want to do something with us. And Kelvin, Kelvin also is also part of um, Fresno Regional Foundation, and Kelvin is a very young, energetic guy and work a lot with youth in Fresno State. So this is our collaborators for the moment, KPFA, Radio Ibero in Mexico City, which is one of the best universities of Latin America, I would say. So, and this is the only university in, 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 in Mexico and Latin America who has masters in radio. So when I approached the director of communications, they, they told me uh, that they want the students to, to be involved in the project, project and send the students to, to the United States and do their social service in this project the students of, uh, of radio. So we have California Rural Legal Assistance that uh, is, uh, is an agency for um, farm labor workers who uh, help them in the, in the rural 
in, in California. So at the moment we're speaking with Dolores Huerta. I met Dolores about two months ago. And Dolores also, uh, when I went and see her, if she wanna be part of this uh, project, she was already telling me stories of her life about what she had done, seen in the fields. And I tell Dolores, hold on, I need the recording machine, I need everything. <laughs> so so it's, an, it's interest in her very much so. So now it's a matter of how we're gonna structure this interest between us. And also uh, Valley PBS in Fresno is part of uh, national public uh, broadcast. So it's very interesting in broadcast vignette of what we do in, in video component. So this is, uh, you can visit us and see us in bobos.org. You can go to Facebook and like us our page in, in Facebook and Twitter. And at the moment, as I speak right now, um, I have a team, my team in, in, in the Bay Area, we put in together a Kickstarter campaign. To Our purpose of this campaign is to gather this fund and uh, refurbish the Airstream and start going with the team of producers. There would be me and other producers from somewhere in the Bay Area, I believe so, and, uh, and start recording these stories because it's, it's the momentum for us to do this. It's really happening right now. At the moment, I'm going the motorcycle, I drive, or whatever, but I, I'm doing it that way. So the kickstarting campaign will help us to refurbish the airstream immediately. So in, for the end of May, I'm aiming to launch the campaign of the Kickstarter. So if you go to the Kickstarter campaign and type, type, type Mobos, you will see that we are launching the campaign. So, when I was 13, a teacher of mine in high school came to me and, um, and um, uh, tell me if I want to say a poem in front of 2,000 people in a plaza in Mexico. I don't know, he had probably sold me something, but uh, he handled me the poem two months before the celebration and said, memorize this poem you will say it to the, in, the, in front of everyone because I know you are the only one who can say it. Well, that gave me a little bit of uh, <laughs> security. I say, okay, if you say so, I will do it. So this poem, I would love to tell you to declamarlo, only a half of the poem because it's a little long, but it's in Spanish. And it's a very protesta words of Spanish. So, and I don't have the translation. I'm so sorry we're working in these things. It's my first presentation. So in the future, we will do the best to finish doing all the translations, which is amazing. When all, I forgot to tell you, also I'm working to collaborate with Radio Friends in Radio Netherlands. And when I approached these two radios, they told me, please do not touch the content. We don't want translations. And I say, what an amazing concept in, in thinking. Why? Because we want to keep these voices as the way they are. So for me, that was beautiful. So I'm trying probably to, to, to replicate a little bit of them, you know. Yeah. In, in general states, you need to translate everything. And it's a little tiring. Mm. So, <laughs> so um, I will tell you the poem only a half. And for the ones who really want the poem later came to me, I have the translation somewhere. Or it's in YouTube, you can find it. If you type that, you will find it. Okay, here we go. Se acabó. Se acabó, de José de Molina. Los pobres solemos mal, a sudor el barajo. Pero abra un rico en canal, ese si apesta carajo olemos por encimita pero tenemos decencia pero al rico toditita le rehiere la conciencia a mi modo de pensar no es decencia el buen vestir ni andar oliendo a jazmín ni lo por fuera hermosear de qué sirve presumir con trapos caros y finos y saludos a repartir tan falsos y tan ladinos esa es costrita delgada 
que se desprende solita. No aguanta ni una lavada con agua dulce o saladita. Por eso al decir decencia, sé bien lo que estoy diciendo. En mi alma está la esencia y no en andar presumiendo. Vean, una mano obrera, una mano campesina, estará vacía de dinero, pero jamás, jamás asesina. So that is, that is only the half of the, of the poem. It continues. Let's go. And this is who is being part of this presentation. Thank you very much to you, Cindy. Questions? I'm here to answer your questions. Yes. Uh, hi, I'm Jacqueline Maria. I, I know you very well. Thank you for coming. Just in case, I'm glad to be here. Uh, so one of my questions is, will you be going to other universities? Uh, for example, will you be presenting this uh, at UCSF at, uh, or any other university? Do you have an invitation for me? Well, I'll, I'll tell I'll you what. As a, <laughs> as a qualitative uh, research scientist who, as you know, works and, and is in the Central Valley now collecting data, this is a very interesting um, you, that you have not only located the gap, uh, but that you have become a leader of change and, and got into action and done something that uh, is, is just remarkable. I, I, it, Thank it, you. It, you know, I tried to prevent myself from you know, just really uh, having an emotional experience with this. It's very, you know, from the Central Valley, uh, and as a farm worker and as somebody who listens to the voices of the people, this is, uh, this is quite remarkable. Thank and you. I, I think, uh, you know, if you're looking for one more person, uh, I'd be more than happy to, uh, to participate at any level. But it's, uh, it's quite amazing. And I, I can't imagine uh, that it took this long, regretfully. But yes. Thank you very much. And, and yes, uh, we will be presenting in Fresno State as well. In, um, in other universities, I know that for sure. But, uh, but I have to thank UCLA to do to, to, to the initiative to do this. They, I thank you very much, Susan and Mele, and all of the professors for, for giving this interest to this project. And the exposure that we have right now is, is beautiful. So absolutely, anywhere in the world, I will be presenting this in France and La Sorbonne if, you, if anyone asks me. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, um, I understand there's growing numbers of indigenous people from Mexico, Guatemala, other that Central American areas, and, and uh, how are their stories, and, and, and are there differences, and how, how does that mean? Thank you for, uh, for just um, asking that question, because I see this project globally. I'm not just seeing for Mexican farm workers. I see this project for the Hmong community, for the Laotians community, for every community. You don't know how many communities we have in the Central Valley. But this is a pilot project, three years only, to start how we can launch this in a better scale, in a larger scale. I, I see in my mind 100 airstreams all over the world gathered in the oral history. It's how I see it, really. Yeah, I, that's my goal. I won't finish that, but probably the students will continue with that. Yes. Following up on that question, I think you said earlier that you were targeting uh, the indigenous farm workers. I'm wondering, I, I, it's my understanding that a lot of them are not fluent in Spanish. Correct. So how will you get their stories? How will you get the questions across to them? Uh, we, have, we will have translators. Uh, California Rural Legal Assistance, we already spoke about that issue. They have translators that will be facilitating those translators for us. So they will accompany the interviewer and translate the questions? Correct. Okay. Yes. And Tricky and, to, and Zapoteco and all of those languages. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's coming. <laughs> yes. I, I, I have a similar, um, well, not a technical question about the method, but about the timeline. I thought it was interesting that, you know, in Chicano and Chicano studies, we always start our history 1848. But people have had a relationship to the land or to, you know, um, cultivating maize and corn so much longer. And so, I think it's interesting maybe not to just start with our political geographic history, okay. but to recognize that longer knowledge 
because we know, you know, with Monsanto and all the threat to the um, GMOs to the corn in Mexico, that's what that threat is, that millennial ancestral knowledge. Absolutely. So, I will and start with Aztecs next okay. time. Yeah. <laughs> or even before Aztecs. Oh, I even before. <laughs> okay, I, 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 I sit down with you and we we'll brief Okay, you tell me. Okay. Like, but it's one of my pet peeves okay. about Chicano State. I mean, I teach in this department, no, but I'm like, we didn't start in 1848. Yeah, yeah. No, no, I know. It's, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. It's, I did this on purpose, like yeah. story time, yeah. because I knew I would, I would come into UCLA, mm -hmm. and I know you guys pay attention to that issue very well. So, thank you for noticing that, and we can talk about that yeah. later. And it, Design something. I better. do have a methods question. I've interviewed Maria Capellan for the. You did? Yes, for the Leaders Campesina. She's a she, part of the Leaders Campesinas in Salinas. Mm. And so I wanted to know if you interview always at the side of the field. Do you interview in the field as people are working or how? Because when I interviewed Maria, it was harvest day. And so all the kids had to come from high school. They were harvesting and they kept looking at us like, get in the field, what are you doing? So we had to hurry to finish the it's interview what and I, go work. It's yeah. what I would like to do. Yeah. It's mm -hmm. what I would like to do because uh, also, uh, I think that says a lot, you know, when you integrate to the community, mm -hmm. when you go to the community, while they working, while they celebrating the Gelaguetza or whatever, you know, doing it in the fields. So oh, how, will you, how long are each interview? Like, how do you, because That is something we need to structure. Yeah. It be, depends because uh, PBS one a vignette of uh, three to five minutes. Mm -hmm. So that, that it depends mm -hmm. which is the venue and broadcast how in uh, C TV radio or uh, internet how we gonna do this. That's the question I'm really thinking about too is how to do formal interviews and have a set of formal interviews and then have the vignettes that are more media friendly. Mm -hmm. Correct. Yeah. So yeah, we we working with uh, with the team. How we want to structure that. I mean, uh, uh, yes, the whole team, well, and also the collaborators because they 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 part of this, so they need to give an input. Yeah. Well, maybe we could talk because I do have twenty oral histories with farm worker women. Okay, they could be integrated. Or absolutely, part of the absolutely. project. I think that's totally possible. Yeah. yeah. How about the farmers? Are they are are they part of your <laughs> yeah. partners? The landowners, the, the farm. That hire the no, well, I don't know at, at this time. I don't know at this time, but I, I would like to be part of this uh, collaboration, like Maria Catalan and Flavio. That is the people that I want to be involved. You know, of course, uh, certain other people, but um, more people that um, are leaders in their communities. Yes. I missed the first part of your um, presentation, but I was wondering what were some of the main questions that you ask um, people, and also if you're, if you're looking for interviews. Then. Okay, that's that's a good thing also that you ask that because because for me it's very important to have people who understand their culture. It's the only way they're gonna give you the true story is people who speak the colloquialism of Michoacán, or Sinaloa, or Guerrero, you know? So how are we gonna structure this? It all depends once we get to the communities and see their necessities first. See, the way I picture this is going to communities first, me and the team, without the airstream, and gather with them. You know, to know to know the team and everything, and everything, and then later, if they receive an invitation and go in with the airstream and start doing something. So the way we're going to structure the questions, it will depends. It's more in, into the human aspect than the political aspect. So, how they came to the United States, how they integrate to this community or to this society, how they think they contribute to this society, more than anything to ask them what they feel being in here and missing their countries. So more of the human reason. And that would depend also of the journalist, of the producer, you know. So if you're gonna be a producer, you just came and we can work in the way of uh, structuring the interview. So that is part of, so of giving you respect as a student or as a producer, how you wanna work. 
I want to share with you, there's a another um, mobile home. I don't know how you came up with the idea, but I didn't know this was like a thing, but there's a, I have friends who also have a mobile home, and they call it the Queer Mobile Homecoming. <laughs> and wow. they drive the mobile home, and they, it's about a black lesbian, you know, oral history recovery project, but they drive the, the mobile home to, you know, Detroit, to New York, to, and they collect the oral history. So I'll give you the little link. Absolutely. Absolutely. I was like, is this a thing, this mobile home oral <laughs> history? <laughs> You're starting a movement. <laughs> that does it. Well, um, <clears throat> and it's another um, woman that she's riding a bicycle in gathering oral history uh, in the United States, but in a bicycle. That's interesting. So, yes, it's many people that I know that I'm involved with that they're doing this in a, in a very beautiful way. Yeah. More questions? I just had a quick one if I don't want to monopolize. Do they often talk to you about their health, considering that they're in the fields generally working? Is there is there data coming out of there with regard to health? If you ask, they will. Mental. They will. Uh, because I work with uh, Radio Bilingue, and uh, I, the, the only questions that I ask is about their health. So if you ask, they will tell you about their health. Absolutely. So. <clears throat> Um, that is another question, you know, how to do this? Because there's so many issues that we can get focused. Mm -hmm. So I want to be very careful how I'm going to approach this mm -hmm. in the best way for humanity. Mm -hmm. That is that is my whole point. So. This is great. Thank you so much. Thank you.